I grew up rich. Now, mom was a school teacher, dad was a farmer. I'm talk, not talking finances here. I'm talking about the fact that I grew up uh, in proximity to all four of my grandparents. Uh, grandma and grandpa lived just over the hill. We lived on the same farm that they did. And uh, uh, grandpa was a dairyman and a uh, man of faith and a man of consistency. And his name was Miles Mowry. And he, that's my middle name, Miles. Um, he's... Uh, he liked black jelly beans, and he loved to lay and listen to the Cardinal baseball game on the radio in the afternoon um, in church every Sunday. You know, dairy farmers don't get Sunday off, but he found a way to honor the Sabbath all the ways that he could. You know, he wouldn't fish on Sunday. I don't know where that's written, you can't fish on Sunday, but I think he kind of saw it as harvesting fish. So, uh, you know, and I'm, you know he, he wouldn't fish on Sunday. Um, I remember him uh, praying for our family dinners and he would fold his hands in front of him and I, I remember the scene of that because uh, he was missing three of his fingers from an auger accident earlier in in life uh, he bought me my first bicycle it was a John Deere bicycle did you know there was such a thing it's a John Deere everything with my grandpa was John Deere so uh, it was yellow so it was construction side Derek I think it is probably it had a black banana seat on it and, um, and just a, an amazing uh, example of a faithful man. My grandma, his wife, was probably the grandparent I logged the most hours with uh, over the years. She was a, uh, my prayer partner all through my life and even up into her 90s. She was on her, physically on her knees praying for me. I really believe she prayed me into the ministry. I believe that. She, I believe she prayed me into the ministry and, and the kingdom of God. Um, she, uh, you know, I, I grew up in the days of half day kindergarten, so she was that other half day, you know, and, uh, and she made great chicken and dumplings, which my cousins put ketchup on for some reason, not sure about that. And, uh, you know, uh, grandpa would never eat chicken because he uh, put two girls through college uh, raising eggs and he'd seen too much. And so she, grandma would always make ham for him. And you know, it's just, just, uh, just living next door to them. Now, my grandpa Ritter, my dad's dad, that, you know, they divorced when my dad was growing up. And uh, my dad's dad was a, was a different guy. He they couldn't have been more different than my other grandpa, but he gave me things I needed. Uh, he spent most of his life in the mental hospital. And he would get out, and it was dad and my job to go check on grandpa. He lived in town. We lived in the farm. He lived in town about four miles away. And, oh, and some people don't know that I grew up in Dixie. I grew up in Illinois, but I grew up in Dixie. In a town of 500 people, rail, railroad tracks through the middle, black folks on one side of the railroad tracks, white folks on the other side of the railroad. I'm not kidding. And, uh, you know, Grandpa was not a, really a churchgoer, but when he went to church, he went to the, uh, he went across the railroad tracks to the black churches because they didn't judge him. And they let him bring his uh, tobacco can in the church with him so he could spit his tobacco out while they worked. He liked the preaching, you know. And uh, my grandpa Ritter uh, bought me my very first BB gun. And, you know, when you put a, a BB gun in the, in the hands of a young boy, you know, you, there, there's a three-hour safety briefing at least, you know, uh, with you're going to shoot your eye out and, you know. Uh, I, I, remember, I remember Grandpa giving me that, that BB gun. He said, here's how you load it, here's how you cock it, have fun. That was, uh, I have both my eyes. I don't know how that happened, but, you know, he just, uh, <laughs> he, just he just let me loose with it. Uh, my grandma, uh, my dad's mom, uh, Grandma Webb, we called her. Virginia was her first name. And she was an amazing woman of faith. She uh, was... Uh, was a deaconess at her church. Uh, she uh, was an amazing cook. We always had Thanksgiving with her, and she just she she was a dietitian in her life, but she she just an amazing cook, and she was always so very and a thoughtful gift giver, and always so interested. She always had all these questions. We knew we were going to be interrogated whenever we were on ground because she wanted to know not only what was happening but how we felt about it and uh, all, all that stuff. And she was just so interested in our lives and always such an amazing cheerleader. I think she was probably our greatest cheerleader growing up. And, uh, you know, she was, one thing I remember about Grandma, is she was the member of the family that voted different than everybody else in the family. And she had, she took a lot of junk about that. But I tell you what, she had a strong principle, strong, uh, you know, a strong backbone about all that. And, uh, 
and her legacy is very much uh, still with me. So I, I just consider myself um, uh, rich, you know, and the Bible has so much to say about generations. Um, you know, Paul wrote to Timothy, your faith, it, it's a living faith, and it first lived in your grandmother Lois, then it lived in your mother Eunice, and now it lives in you. Faith pa is passed on through the generations. I love that Michelle Howlett is doing this seminar because, you know, she's really intentional about passing on her faith to her grandkids. In fact, she wrote a book, basically, for all of her grandkids, what she believes and what they should believe about God. She asked me to read it over to make sure it was theologically correct, but she's got a great, uh, great ideas about passing on the faith. You know, it says in the Psalms that one generation shall command the works of God to another generation and declare your mighty acts. And I love that we have such a multi-generational uh, service here this morning. So we're in the book of Ecclesiastes, and it is wisdom from an older person to younger people. It is from Solomon, who's been there, done that, got the t-shirt. It's the book of the Bible that doesn't seem to fit with any of the others. The tone is totally different. Uh, it's like all the, the paint on Solomon's palette are dark colors, and he paints with that. And basically, the, if I had to summarize the message of Ecclesiastes, it's that life is an Easter egg hunt without any Easter eggs. Okay, the, the, the central word in the book is hevel. It's a Hebrew word, and it's translated meaningless. Life is meaningless. Uh, sometimes it's translated vanity. It, it carries with it the connotation of being vaporous or, or transient or, or not lasting. He's somebody that made his life. He had all the wealth, all the power, and he made his life into a living laboratory into what can we learn about life? What is life really about? He looked at everything he could under the sun. He had uh, 700 wives. He had 300 concubines. He had wealth untold. And at the end of his life, He's saying, you know what, all the things that I chased after most of my life are pretty meaningless. And he has some things to say here about aging. We're talking about wisdom of the, of the ages. So, um, you know, we looked at Ecclesiastes 1 last week. Ecclesiastes 12, the last chapter, and, and by the way, read the whole book during this series. I want you to get, a, get the sense of it, get the flavor of it. But there's always, there's this poetry in, in Ecclesiastes 12 that says, honor God in your youth because, you know, the, one day the, the silver cord will be snapped, the golden bowl will be broken, the sound of grinding will cease, and the, the sound of maidens you, you won't hear. And it's, it's such a poetic passage. I ran across a, uh, the New Century version of that. It's a different Bible translation. They try to take all the metaphors out of it. And, um, and here's how it reads um, in Ecclesiastes 12. When you get old, the light from the sun, moon, and stars will grow dark. The rain clouds will never seem to go away. Are you encouraged yet? At that time, your arms will shake and your legs will become weak. Your teeth will fall out so you can't chew. And your eyes will not see clearly. Your ears will be deaf to the noise in the streets and you'll barely hear the millstone grinding grain. You'll wake up when the birds start singing, but you'll barely hear singing at all. You're going to fear high places and afraid to go for a walk. Your hair will become white. You'll limp along like a grasshopper when you walk. Your appetite will be gone. Then you will go to your everlasting home, and people will go to your funeral. <clears throat> you didn't have to say it like that. <laughs> I like the poetic version uh, better. But there is wisdom from living a long time. We need to lean in to people who have lived a long Even though the, the palette is dark, I, I, I think there's a reason why Ecclesiastes is in the Bible, why we call it the Word of God. Uh, would you stand, please, for the reading of God's Word? We're going to look in Ecclesiastes 7 today. A good name is better than fine perfume, and the day of death better than the day of birth. It's better to go to the house of mourning than to the house of feasting. For death is the destiny of everyone, the living should take this to heart. Frustration is better than laughter, because a sad face is good for the heart. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning. But the heart of the fools is in the house of pleasure. It's better to heed the rebuke of a wise person than to listen to the song of fools like the crackling of thorns under the pot. 
So is the laughter of fools. This too is meaningless. Extortion turns a wise person into a fool and a bribe corrupts the heart. The end of the matter is better than its beginning. And patience is better than pride. Do not be quickly provoked by your spirit, in your spirit, for anger resides in the lap of fools. Do not say, where were the old days? They were better than these. For it's not wise to ask such questions. Wisdom, like an inheritance, is a good thing and benefits those who see the sun. Wisdom is a shelter, as money is a shelter. But the advantage of knowledge is this. Wisdom preserves those who have it. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me quickly? Lord, this is your word. Uh, shine the light of your Holy Spirit in our hearts to understand it and apply it to our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Uh, you may be seated. I had a pastor one time that was into cologne. And uh, he, had, uh, he actually mixed his own. He's the only person I ever know to do this. Uh, he took three different colognes and he mixed his own signature scent and then he bathed in it. I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure uh, because I tell you what, he would pray for you and put, like, put, you, put his hand on your shoulder and you'd smell like, and it was very distinctive. And he wouldn't share his recipe with anybody. I don't know if people were actually clamoring for it or anything, but, but he wouldn't share that with anybody. And he'd give you a piece of paper or something, and, and, and you just, it just smelled like him. He had, a, he had a signature scent. And whether we realize it or not, really all of us have a signature scent. Our life gives off something. It goes, it's around us. It's before us. And Ecclesiastes says that a good name is better to be chosen than, than fine perfume, which is one of the more expensive things in the ancient world, colognes and perfumes. Now, you know, you just got, uh, uh, you can buy it by the gallon, pretty cheap. But back then, you know, these, these were expensive uh, fragrances, and I'm allergic to all of them. So um, a good name is better to be chosen than, than, than fine uh, perfume. And uh, our our name and our reputation is, is a test we can't cram for because it's something that's built on a, on a daily basis. And sometimes we look at success as, you know, we're looking at the silver bullet, we're trying to read uh, uh, Dr. Wonderful's book about whatever because we want to find the secret or, you know, the, kind of the silver bullet that will bring, bring success. And, and um, you know, Solomon's telling us here, it's not, the, it's not the things we do occasionally that bring success, it's the things we do consistently. We, we build our lives one block at a time, and it becomes our reputation, it becomes our way of living. There's really no shortcut to that. It, it, it's, it's about, uh, you know, faithfulness over time is what uh, builds our lives. So, you know, somebody that was truly successful in the terms of money, and well, he says, really, it's your, it's your reputation that's your, real, that's your real wealth. That's where the real value is, and that can only be built uh, one step at a time. Um, let's look at um, verse 2. It's better to go to the house of mourning than the house of feasting, for death is the destiny of everyone. The living should take this to heart. Um, you know, that's not wisdom we hear a lot of. If you had an invitation to a party or an opportunity to go to a funeral, Solomon's telling us, go to the funeral. There's more for you there than at a, than at a party. Uh, most of us would rather go to a party than a, than a funeral. But I do a lot of funerals, and I, so therefore I attend a lot of funerals. And, um, you know, there's, it, it's just, that's another, talk about a test you can't cram for. You know, there's some that just have a legacy of faithfulness. There are some folks that just live it out in such a beautiful, amazing uh, way. And their life has been uh, consistent over the, over the years. It's been diligent over the years. And, you know, I can always find something good to say about everybody. Sometimes I've got to add a little water to the mix, right? But, uh, but usually, you know, we can have something good to say about everybody. But there's something different when somebody has just lived their life. And Solomon said, go to a funeral, go to the house where there's mourning, because it's going to teach you about your, your destiny. You know, some people have said that we would all do well to write our own obituary. What do we want people to say about us when we're gone? And live toward that goal. 
Live every day with your death in mind. That's not something we do. You know, our culture wants us to not think about death and kind of whistle past the graveyard and not think about it. And we really have a cult of youth in our, in our whole culture. We really worship youth. But Solomon's telling us something different here. He's the contrary voice. And he's saying it's better to go to the house of mourning than the house of of feasting. You know, Stephen Covey in his uh, Habits of Highly Effective People, he said it this way, begin with the end in mind. Well, this is just another way of saying that. Think where, where, what you want people to say about you when you're gone and live that kind of legacy. Keep the habits. We talk a lot about habits in this church because it's the daily things that really matter. Um, and, and, and build the habits in your life, the disciplines in your life that are gonna that are gonna help you give there. And he says it, it's it's good to think about your death. It's good to think about that life isn't forever. Uh, this week the big news has been the death of Queen Elizabeth, and I've been watching some of the coverage and things. And you know, uh, I know some people say, well, we fought a war in 1770, so we don't have to worry about all those folks. But I tell you what, I love Queen Elizabeth because she's faithful. Some people say, well, she's queen, she had an easy life. Not so much. You know, uh, everything in her family, all the dysfunctions were on big display. And she kind of modeled grace and consistency and faith through all that. You got you to gotta honor that. You know, being over 70 years on the throne and just, uh, and just uh, being, uh, trying to model decency and faith and conviction uh, and love and service and all that. I, I think it's a beautiful thing. Um, Let's look, let's look down at, uh, at verse 3. Frustration is better than laughter. I'm not getting a lot of amens this morning. <laughs> because a sad face is good for the heart. You, the heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of pleasure. It's better to have a, um, a sad face. You know, um, we, uh, we, we have pain in our lives. And somewhere along the way, we got taught that what we do with our pain is we stuff it down as deeply as we can inside of us and put on a happy face. And social media has allowed us to do that on a grand scale. You know, everybody puts their, uh, you know, everybody puts their, their highlight reel, you know, and, and, and their life looks so good on there. And we're, we're kind of taught to just show the, the good stuff. You know, the culture in which Jesus was raised in was not that way. They were very much emotive with their pain. In fact, the Bible comes out of this Eastern culture. There's a whole book in the Bible called Lamentations, right? And when Jesus was upset, you kind of knew it because he wept at the tomb of his friend Lazarus. He wept over Jerusalem. He wept and he prayed in the garden. And from the cross, he said, my God, my God, why have you uh, forsaken me? He was honest with his emotions. And I kind of wonder if a lot of the dysfunctions in our world, and I'm talking about uh, substance abuse and alcoholism and depression and heart disease, and there's a lot, these are multi-causal things, and I'm not talking about a silver bullet here, but I wonder if a contributing factor isn't the fact that we do not process our pain. We stuff it, we pretend it's not there, um, and it leaks out in other ways. And so um, Ecclesiastes is calling us to be, to be honest. Doesn't mean you have to bleed on everybody that you meet. That's not the kind of person you want to be. I got a friend who posts every day, another lousy day. Some, some version of this, it's another lousy day. You know, um, I'm, I'm not talking about being that guy. But you know, there's, uh, we need to be honest with ourselves, honest with God, honest with others. And sometimes that means um, processing our pain sometimes even in a public way, or, or with our friends, or with people that we can trust, instead of uh, not just always pretending that, uh, that it's not there. Be, be honest. Unprocessed pain uh, kills. I'm convinced of that. Uh, verse 5, it's better to heed a rebuke of the wise person than to listen to the song of fools. Like the crackling of thorns under the pot, so is the laughter of fools. This too is meaningless. None of us like to be rebuked. None of us like to be corrected. But Solomon's telling us it's better to be corrected by somebody that's wise than just to be entertained by fools. And we've got, we spend a lot of energy in our world just trying to be entertained. 
We spend a lot of energy just trying to be, have voices in us that tell us how wonderful we are. And, uh, you know, we have two ears and we need to, you know, I think what Solomon's saying, we need to open one ear and shut the other because there's a lot of voices out there and they're all willing to tell us how we should live our lives. And we need to learn to focus in on the ones that are going to help us, the ones that are going to be there, and also the ones that are going to be invested. Um, Solomon says that fools are like thorns that are put into the fire and lit. You know, they're, they're, if you kind of think about kindling things that burn up really quick, there's certain things you put in the fire, they, they flash really big and they create a lot of heat and a lot of blaze, but they don't last. And he's saying that's how fools are. They might be there for your celebration. They might be there for a little bit of your life when things are going good. But when the chips are down, they don't have the staying power. Because it's really about, uh, it's really about who's going to be there with you through your life, not the people that are going to be there when, everything's, when everything is hunky-dory. So we need to learn to uh, mute some voices in our life. Uh, I'm talking about the heckles from the cheap seats, the people that want to criticize you that really don't care a thing about you or what your life's about. I'm talking about people that are willing to cheer you on just to make you feel good, but not willing to speak hard truth in your life. And we need to lean into those voices that are speaking truth, that are speaking life, that are speaking love to us, and that are there with us through the, through the long run. Uh, keep one ear open and, uh, and shut the other to all the other uh, stuff that's, uh, that's out there. Um, we need to learn to honor um, longevity in our friendships. Verse 7 extortion turns a wise person into a fool and a bribe corrupts the heart you know as a king uh solomon is realizing that in government in work in finance there's always shortcuts i bet whatever line of work that you're in there's a way to do it unethically there's a way to take a shortcut there's a way to do the wrong thing and ecclesiastes is telling us that moral shortcuts are really dead ends you, you, you can't, there's, there's no right way to do the wrong thing. Uh, you, you've got to be, uh, you, you've got to be ethical in your, in your treatment. You can't let, you can't let your heart be corrupted by the quick fix or the quick thing. Uh, you've got to, you, you can't, uh, you can't uh, go off into that, into that realm. Now verse eight, the heart of the matter is, the end of the matter is better than the beginning and patience is better than pride. You know, we, uh, our culture honors falling in love. There's so many stories about falling in love. I think we need to honor more staying in love because it's not how you start. It's easy to have a good start. It's easy to be fast out of the blocks. It, it's not how you start in life. It's, it's how you finish. And that's really where the hard work in life is, is, is leading toward a, a good finish. It's, it's not how you start. It's how you finish. The end of the matter is the most important thing. You can start out well, but, but how are you going to finish? Look at this, verse 9. Do not be quickly provoked in your spirit, for anger resides in the lap of fools. You know, your emotions are a gift from God. They're created by God. God gave you emotions. But they're not to be your masters. They're to be your servants. And, um, we, and he said that uh, to being quick with your emotions, to quick with anger, this is a, Solomon sees this as a, as a sign of, of foolishness. Um, how many of you have a dog? Would you raise your hand if you have a dog in your house? Yeah, we, we've got a dog, her name's Dottie. You know, there's, there's, uh, there's nice dogs. You know, and a nice dog might be uh, goofy, uh, silly, uh, always ready for a treat. You got to like a nice dog, you know, just, just happy-go-lucky. And uh, there's also mean dogs. Somebody wrote a book said there's no bad dogs, there's just bad owners. But, but there, there's some dogs, because of how they've been treated or whatever, that are temperamental, that uh, you never know when you're going to get bit. They, they lash out at the wrong time to the wrong people. You don't want to be a mean dog. You know, well, I'm going to be a nice dog and not a mean dog. But there's another choice. You know, and they're also good dogs. You know, a good dog is faithful and true and good with family. But if there's a threat, they've got a different gear. And they deal with the, they deal with the threat. Maybe you're walking down the trail and there's a snake in front of you. And uh, you don't see it, but the dog does. You ever seen a dog get a snake? Kill it. And you say, good dog, good dog. <laughs> 
I think Solomon's telling us you don't want to be a nice dog. You don't just want to be a, you don't want to be a mean dog, for sure. And some people go around life like a mean dog, lashing out the people they're supposed to be loving. Be, be a good dog. Your, your, your emotions are there. If you need to, you know, on those very rare occasions, you need to step up, take three steps closer to somebody and lean into them and speak hard truth. You can do that. Uh, but most of the time you're in nice dog mode, you know. Be a, be a good dog. Don't be a servant to your master. Be the master over your emotions. Uh, don't be a servant to your emotions. And, uh, and that's part of wisdom, walking wisely. Uh, um, Solomon's going to tell us. Don't be quickly provoked. Verse 10, do not say, why were the old days better than these? <laughs> it, for not, it's not wise to ask such questions. You know, you've got a windshield and you've got a rearview mirror. Your windshield's a lot bigger than your rearview mirror. Because the, wind, the windshield is what's going to help you to uh, navigate. Now, there is some time to look backwards. We need to, for gratitude, we need to look backward. Okay, we need to look backward for perspective sometimes. Um, for healing, for forgiveness. But most of our life should be spent looking in the windshield, not the, not the rearview mirror. You can't move forward by living in the past. And we're, we're, we're tempted to, to look backward and say, boy, I wish I'd done this, or I wish my life was different. I wish I'd, I maybe took a turn back there. But Paul, um, Solomon's reminding us that all the opportunities are before us. They're not, not, there's no opportunities behind you. All the opportunities are ahead of you. And so, uh, and so keep your eyes um, looking forward. You know, my dad, uh, when he... Uh, there was a point in my life, about seventh, eighth grade. You know, I used to love summer. You know, summer was your time. And about seventh, eighth day, eighth grade, my dad said, "No, this is now farming time." And so uh, he would take me to his farms, which is not where we lived. And uh, he put me on his John Deere 4020. It was a tricycle type uh, John Deere tractor, and it was designed to kick dust in your face all day long. But that was the tractor I, I most often drove. And I remember his first lesson. He said, now, uh, what I want you to do, son, I want you to plow this field, and I want you to, to, to find a, a spot on the horizon way over there, and I want you to head toward that spot. Now, don't look behind you. Don't look down. Don't look over here. You just keep your eye on the goal. Keep your eye on where you want to go, and you're going to plow a, a straight row. So I got in the tractor. And I picked out a, a tree or a bush or a fence post, I don't know what it was, on the other end of the field. And I, and I, I plowed across that big, long field on what we called our Dexter farm. And, um, and my dad um, looked back on that row and he said, that is, I couldn't have done any better myself. That was amazing. That was such a, a straight row. Good job. He said, I, and, and, and he told a friend, I think I got an ace here. I think he's going to be a farmer. What he didn't realize is seventh, eighth grade, that was a one of. Uh, <clears throat> because as you're just kind of out there in the field, you know, there's a lot, oh, there's a bird, oh, there's a, you know, you know and uh, looking back, dad would come back and check on me. He said, son, what in the world did you do to my field? Do you know my friends have to drive by this field to, to see what it looks like, you know? <laughs> it's so easy to get your eyes off the point in the horizon where you're headed. And Ecclesiastes is giving us, the, giving us the wisdom to say your, your opportunities are not in the rearview mirror. Your opportunities are all in the windshield. They're ahead of you. And so figure out where God's taking you to go. Keep your eye on that. Keep moving forward. Write your obituary. Decide what you want people to say about you in your life and live every day toward that. So much of life is meaningless, but here's a few tips on what I found from what doesn't work to help you tune in to what, uh, to what does work. Would you stand with me, please? We're going to have a moment of prayer here. And um, I would challenge you to uh, read through Ecclesiastes. It will not cheer you up at all, okay? Uh, it's not there to cheer us up. Make, it, it's there to, to show us uh, kind of the, the transience of life. But there's wisdom there from somebody who's been there, done that, got the t-shirt, tried it all, done it all, had it all, to try to show us that there's a lot of dead ends in this world. And um, the, the end of the matter is fear God and to walk in His ways. Gracious God, 
Thank you for wisdom from generations passed down to us. Thank you for grandparents today. They're such an important voice in our lives. They have perspective that we don't have. They have time. They have, uh, they have uh, the desire to invest in us and to shape our lives. Lord God, we pray that your Holy Spirit would be upon our church as we go through the, the uh, unexpected wisdom in the book of Ecclesiastes. We pray, Lord, that we would all walk in wisdom, see your way, see your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.